In Iraq, private security from Constellus Patrol U.S. embassies, glad to have secured another 10-year contract for their services, 25 years after its supposed dissolution, executive outcomes are once again guarding oil fields and mining sites across Africa. And in Ukraine, soldiers of the Wagner Group continue fighting in the field, even after their leader's failed rebellion against the Russian government. Now more than ever, mercenaries have become sought after for their services across the globe in a myriad of conflicts. But where did they come from? The idea of a soldier for hire is nothing new. Since the ancient period, mercenaries were popularly used to supplement and sometimes replace regular armies out on campaign or in the field. However, in the mid-19th century, nations shifted their focus away from mercenaries and toward developing their own regular forces. Only in recent decades has there been a new demand for soldiers of fortune. Though concerns about their dubious ethics and profit-driven motives have led to questions about their legality, this resulted in the United Nations adopting the International Convention Against the Recruitment, Use, Financing, and Training of Mercenaries Treaty in December of 1989. With the primary gain of suppressing access to mercenary services, this treaty entered into force on October 2001 and defined a mercenary as any person who is recruited locally or abroad to take on a combat role, does so for the sake of private gain, is not a resident, national, or military personnel of the parties to the conflict, and has not been sent on official state military duty. In order to circumvent these rules, many enterprising professionals would go on to form private military companies, or PMCs, which differ just enough from the mercenary definition to maintain legality. Where mercenaries engage in combat, PMCs claim to act in self-defense. Where mercenaries get deployed, PMCs conduct routine security. Often working as international firms, PMCs provide militaries and political entities services such as combat assistance, military training, risk assessment, logistics, intelligence, and security. Many of these companies are useful to world powers, as the discrete connections between a PMC and its client allow for a client's involvement by proxy into conflicts as unofficial belligerents, permitting them to exercise geopolitical and military influence without having to suffer the casualties or logistical concerns of a traditional military force. Before we continue, I'd like to take a moment to thank the sponsor of today's video, Enlisted. Enlisted is a free-to-play World War II multiplayer shooter available for PC, Xbox Series X and S, PlayStation 5, and previous generations. With a strong focus on historical authenticity, Enlisted's dynamic gameplay puts players in the middle of the action by allowing you to play whole campaigns on an epic scale as either the Allies or Axis, and command infantry squads, tank crews, and aircraft using historically accurate weapons like the M1 Garand and iconic vehicles like the M4 Sherman and the P-51 Mustang. I especially enjoy commanding, equipping, and customizing my own personal squad of soldiers and specialists. Register and play for free using our link in the description below and join millions of players from all around the world on PC, PlayStation, and Xbox. Players who register will also receive a huge bonus pack of three days of premium time and several orders for troops and weapons. No purchase necessary. Simply use our link to register, download, and play in listed today. This flexibility and discretion have made PMCs a staple of modern conflicts. For example, in 2007, over 180,000 private contractors across more than 20 companies were operating in Iraq, with around 25% of these engaged in combat operations. American PMCs have also been involved in attempts to overthrow entire governments, like Silvercorp USA, who participated in the failed operation aimed at deposing Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro. In the 1990s, the South African PMC Executive Outcomes had over 3,000 troops and 500 military officers operating across 10 countries in Africa, many from the SAS and South African Special Forces. While South Africa shut down Executive Outcomes through anti-mercenary legislation in 1998, the company was re-established in 2020 and still operates today.
One of the earliest examples of the modern PMC can be traced back to the KMS LTD, better known as the Keeney Meany Services. Founded in 1975 by four British war veterans and staffed by ex-SAS personnel, Kini Mini started out protecting British diplomats in Buenos Aires, then in 1976 expanded to training the Sultan of Oman's Special Forces, a unit set up and commanded by Kini Mini contractors directly. Information on KMS is shadowy. Numerous investigations turned up dead ends, as prospective interviewees refused to discuss KMS. The British Foreign Office claimed to know very little about KMS, however, this was far from the case. KMS was heavily involved in the Sri Lankan Civil War, which occurred between 1983 and 2009. It was a conflict fought primarily between the Sinhalese Sri Lankan government and Tamil separatists, namely the Liberation Tigers of Tamil Ilam, who were frustrated by discrimination and wished to carve out their own ethnic state. Amid this fighting, the Sri Lankan police decided they wanted to be able to engage the rebels directly in special forces operations. Kini Mini arrived in Sri Lanka in 1984 and was tasked with training and equipping a force of 600 men, soon to be known as the Sri Lankan Police Special Task Force, or STF. KMS promised 120 new STF personnel members every 12 weeks to engage the rebels. On September 1, 1984, the STF convoy near Point Pedro was hit by a rebel landmine. Four STF members were killed, and the STF responded by burning buildings, shops, a college, and the Point Pedro library, killing several civilians. The regular Sri Lankan army was known to retaliate against civilians after ambushes, but with the STF, things were different. As a fresh unit, trained only by KMS and its professional soldiers, there was shock as to why the STF would act in this way. Rather than pull KMS back, the British reasoned that if their people didn't train the Sri Lankans, they might be desperate enough to seek out mercenaries from America, France, or Belgium, who they believed would only worsen the situation. At the end of 1984, the British approved Kini Mini to train the Sri Lankan army as well. Britain had few economic interests in Sri Lanka, but it did have billions of pounds in India. India supported the Tamil side of the conflict, and KMS support of the Sri Lankan government looked bad on Britain, whose concerns over other nations getting involved in Kini Mini's place convinced them to let the mercenaries continue. Utilizing the KMS mercenaries allowed the Foreign Office to get involved without officially doing so, avoiding some degree of backlash. Meanwhile, KMS contractors continued serving with the STF well into the war, with some even operating as pilots for gunships that terrorized Tamil villages. All the while Britain stood by, worrying that their intervention would provoke backlash from both India and the international community. While KMS closed down in the 1990s, a new contractor would find its beginnings in America, Blackwater. Founded in 1995 by former U.S. Navy SEAL Eric Prince, Blackwater at first offered typical PMC services, such as domestic security and military training. By 1998, Blackwater received its first contracts for expanded military training, spending its early years working with small military units and law enforcement. Things changed after the attacks on September 11th, when the U.S. government became extremely concerned with security and terrorist activity. Blackwater was shortly contracted and asked to provide emergency assistance during the 2001 invasion of Afghanistan. During the war in Iraq, the American diplomat Paul Bramer was sent to Baghdad to serve as Director of Reconstruction and Humanitarian Assistance, as well as heading the Coalition Provisional Authority, which looked to transition the Iraqi government away from the previous Ba'athist party under Saddam Hussein. As the de facto leader of Iraq and representative of the American occupiers, Bremer wasn't the most popular among native Iraqis, meaning his presence was immediately met with threats and condemnation. In response, Blackwater was sent to protect Bremer. With this contract, Blackwater gained a foothold in the War on Terror and with the American government. During this period, on December 6, 2003, Blackwater first proved its value to the U.S. government. 
Bremer and his aide, Brian McCormick, were traveling in an armored SUV as part of a convoy, protected by two Bell helicopters, each containing two Blackwater snipers. Suddenly, the convoy's lead vehicle hit an IED, resulting in an explosion quickly followed by AK-47 fire from resistance fighters. Blackwater's protection of Bremer in this assassination attempt, in which all escaped uninjured, made it clear to America and the world what the PMC was capable of. Blackwater's effectiveness was countered by its callous behavior and general trigger-happy aggressiveness, with the PMC instigating around 163 out of 195 shooting incidents since 2005. Eventually, Blackwater's recklessness would be their undoing. In the Nisor Square incident in Iraq on September 16, 2007, four Blackwater members opened fire in a crowded Baghdad intersection, resulting in the death of 17 unarmed civilians and severe injury of 14 others. The incident caused outrage among the Iraqi populace, and in response, U.S. officials quickly removed Blackwater agents from the country. Get access to over 100 exclusive history videos on our website, Armchair History TV. Use code MERCENARY50 for half off your first month. Three of the Blackwater members were found guilty of voluntary manslaughter, and the fourth of first-degree murder. Throughout the hearings, Eric Prince defended Blackwater and the members involved in the incident. Eventually, Prince would leave the company, and Blackwater would change its name to XE Services, then to Academy, before finally merging with its rival group, Triple Canopy, to form Constellus Holdings. Under Constellus, many PMCs still operate across the Middle East. As for Prince, he would go on to serve as the head of Frontier Services Group, a PMC heavily invested in by China and positioned throughout Africa. While these groups would host the attention of many analysts throughout the 2010s, it's safe to say that the limelight has shifted back towards Russia thanks to the recent conflicts in Syria and Ukraine, both of which enlisted the influential and now infamous Wagner Group. Established in 2014 by Dmitry Yutkin, a veteran of the Chechen Wars, Wagner was owned and funded by Yevgeny Prigozhin a Russian oligarch nicknamed Putin's chef due to his catering services provided to the Kremlin. Wagner's personnel typically consist of Russian ex-military operatives, though more controversial elements include units ranging from foreign volunteers, such as the Scandinavian Nidhogg unit and the Serb unit, to specialized volunteers with connections to far-right circles like the Rusic unit. As one of Russia's biggest PMC groups, Wagner has been instrumental in Russia's quest to gain geopolitical footholds and influence around the world, all without the need of sending actual troops into international conflicts. Wagner has gained Russia sizable influence in Africa, including access to diamonds, oil, and warm water ports. Through Wagner, Russia has been able to establish an overseas presence with little risk, only making use of the Russian military to step in once situations have stabilized. Wagner was first deployed in Ukraine in 2014, where it assisted Russia in its annexation of Crimea. They then provided support to separatist forces in the Luhansk People's Republic, with their work including assassinations and participation in the Battle of Debaltseva in 2015. At a state dinner in December 2016, notably attended by Yutkin, other members of Wagner, and Russian President Vladimir Putin, Yutkin was given a state medal for courage on the battlefield, which caused some wonder if Wagner was allowing Russia to get involved in combat situations without officially sending their military. During the Syrian civil war, the Syrian army's manpower fell from 250,000 at the beginning of the conflict in 2011 to only 125,000 by 2015. In need of soldiers to fight ISIS and other Syrian rebels, Syria requested help. Russia extended its hand, providing logistical support, along with the deployment of troops in 2015, followed shortly by the Wagner Group. The PMC was first tasked with protecting military bases and other infrastructure, but before long had been shifted to a combat role. In late 2016, the Syrian government reached an agreement with Prigozhin's company Evropolis, which made it responsible for retaking Syrian oil fields within ISIS territory, protecting and transporting their products, and in return receiving a quarter of the profits. 
Conveniently, Wagner Group was used as the muscle to complete this goal. By February 2018, Syrian soldiers, special ops forces, and Wagner contractors converged on an outpost around Deir Azor, located nearby an oil refinery. The outpost housed American special ops and Syrian democratic forces engaged in operations against ISIS. Confused by the larger number of groups engaged in the region, U.S. military command contacted Russia to determine whether they had soldiers present around the outpost. The answer was no. And the U.S. called ground and airstrikes, resulting in up to 200 casualties, including dozens of Wagner personnel. When asked about the incident, Russia denied involvement, and even when it became clear that they were there, they still refused to acknowledge Wagner's participation in the attack. With Russia's oil and gas economy hampered by U.S. sanctions, Wagner began moving their focus toward Africa, entering into multi-million dollar agreements with African states in need of energy and electricity. Wagner deployed to several of these nations, with one notable example being the Central African Republic, which had recently been embroiled in a civil war. The UN's peacekeeping force in the region was left ineffective by its low numbers, and by 2017, Russia offered to help the Central African Republic, and that help came in the form of Wagner. In return for this assistance, Russian mining companies were given access to the Central African gold and diamond deposits, both heavily guarded by Wagner personnel. Russia's connection to the Central African Republic has given them political influence in the country, with Wagner investing in radio stations that broadcast pro-Russian propaganda and billboards promoting Russia's good intentions. Similar situations unfolded in Libya and Sudan, where Wagner's support of the highest bidder has gained Russia access to substantial oil reserves in Libya and Sudanese borders for use in smuggling out their newly mined diamonds from Central Africa, skirting U.S. sanctions. Expectedly, Russia has also deployed Wagner soldiers in Ukraine. Exact numbers on Wagner casualties thus far are unclear, though President Volodymyr Zelensky claims Ukrainian forces have killed 21,000 Wagner personnel in just eastern Ukraine alone. Throughout this conflict, Prigozhin wasn't shy about letting the Russian government know when he was unhappy with them. He had complained about a lack of ammunition, high casualties, and poor strategy in Ukraine, even foreshadowing the possibility of revolution in Russia if the government didn't put more effort into the war. On June 23, 2023, Prigozhin accused Russia of falsely justifying the war in Ukraine and expressed deep frustration with the military leaders running the operation. He also accused Russia of staging an attack on Wagner, an allegation which was denied. Regardless, Prigozhin ordered an armored convoy of Wagner troops to drive on Moscow, stating that he and those with him were going to find out why there is such chaos in the country. President Putin's response was to call the action treasonous, to which Prigozhin objected, arguing that he was not betraying Russia or challenging Putin's leadership. According to Prigozhin himself, the convoy came within 200 kilometers of Moscow without any Wagner blood spilled. Though by the end of June 24th, Prigozhin suddenly ordered his soldiers to end the march and return to base. The official reason for calling off this move came from the Belarusian president, Alexander Lukashenko, who brokered a settlement with Prigozhin, who in turn agreed to end the rebellion. By August 23rd, Prigozhin was killed in a plane crash while over Russia. While the use of mercenaries can be seen as lucrative and discreet, it is clear that these contracts are not without their problems. No matter the country of origin, the enterprising nature of private military companies means that they will value the bottom line of their own company and employees over the concerns of any client or setting that they're working in, a factor made worse by the nature of their dangerous work as soldiers for hire. Though volatile and self-serving, Mercenaries remain popular instruments of modern warfare. No doubt we will see them in conflicts to come. Thank you again to Enlisted for sponsoring today's video. Use our link in the description to download the game, get your exclusive bonus, and play Enlisted for free on PC, PlayStation, and Xbox.